current presentation is covering chapter seven that refers to the prenatal care. This slide summarizes the uh, learning ob objectives for um, chapter seven, prenatal care. Take a few seconds to um, look over those. Early prenatal care. Now, having a healthy pregnancy is one of the best ways to have a healthy birth and finally have a healthy baby. Getting early and regular prenatal care improves the chances of a healthy pregnancy. And um, the first prenatal visit uh, should occur as soon as the woman thinks she might be pregnant. Well, of course, the main objective for the woman is to confirm the pregnancy. Um, and usually, um, that's why most of the women will look for um, for a first a prenatal um, doctor's office visit. They may have the um, hope test done and uh, positive. However, sometimes those can have a high rate of um, false positive. Now, what do you think is the next question that a woman will ask in a doctor's office after the pregnancy is confirmed? Well, I'll give you the answer. The next question will be, when is the baby due? And the objective of the care provider are a little bit more complicated and involve identifying all those risk factors for the pregnancy and will include also the education for the mother um, regarding self-care um, and how to recognize any dangerous signs that she needs to be aware of and what to do if she uh, recognizes those signs. So the first prenatal visit will usually be the longest um, because the baseline data, the whole history, uh, all the elements of uh, getting accustomed with a new patient because it's most of the time a new patient for that office um, are obtained at this visit. All subsequent assessments are compared to this baseline data and will kind of um, fit in as a next piece in the puzzle. The major objective for the first visit will be to confirm or rule out the diagnosis of pregnancy. Uh, we'll look also into finding out that if the patient has any risk factors. Uh, they will also determine or estimate the due date. And um, this visit is very uh, essential to answer some of the questions that the patient may have. So how do we, uh, how do we get to fulfill all, the, all those objectives for the first visit. And that will be through um, a very thorough history taking, a head to toe physical examination. There will be some lab work done. And at the end of the, all those, um, there will be education provided on how to maintain a healthy pregnancy and uh, what to expect until the next visit that will be scheduled. Now let's look a little bit more in depth um, into this first prenatal visit. And the history is one of the most important elements of the first prenatal visit. And to review the history thoroughly and report any abnormal or unusual details is essential. There are several parts to the history. And um, if we are going back to a normal patient, we'll have what is called a chief complaint. Um, in this case, um, it's not a complaint per se because uh, the woman is already having the suspicion or she has a home test that confirms that she's pregnant and the pregnancy may not be seen as a complaint, um, but that's how we call it as a general term to keep the same kind of terminology among all the um, patients that we have. We'll include the reproductive history, the medical surgical history, the family history and the social history um, and the obstetric history. It represents that part of the reproductive history. Just to make you, um, to put, uh, terminology in uh, in place, we look at obstetrics and we call obstetricians uh, or obstetric, uh, obstetrics pathology, uh, all those pathologies that are related and are involving the reproductive capacity of a woman, a woman and they are related to a pregnancy. Whenever a woman is searching help um, from a doctor for anything else that is unrelated to a pregnancy, that will be her gynecological uh, um, pathology or complaint. Uh, so all the disorders that are not related to pregnancy are gynecological 
uh, issues, while those that are connected to the pregnancy existent uh, or um, that they are wishing to become pregnant, that would be obstetrics. And definitely your doctors, some of them will be more involved with obstetrics, will be uh, more uh, prone to have those uh, female that um, are expecting to become mothers or um, they are involved with IVF procedures while other doctors will have more gynecological type of um, conditions or patients will be more focused on treatment of cancers. Uh, so there is a kind of a split into uh, what the um, what your doctors will uh, do and, and however will be those that will do uh, both of them. So I was telling you that the obstetrics is part of the reproductive uh, history, history. And we are reviewing uh, with our patients um, any details uh, for any other pregnancy previous to this one. And we are including in this history of miscarriages and abortions and the outcome of each pregnancy. For example, how many weeks the pregnancy lasted and whether or not the pregnancy ended with a living child. Now, just to make sure that again, we have the good terminology in place. Abortions are most of the time um, is um, that process that a doctor will interrupt the development of a um, pregnancy uh, because the woman is asking for that. While a miscarriage is a loss of a pregnancy, um, unwilling uh, because some uh, health issues that can be related to the mother or to the fetus. So when we are looking into this history, there are some uh, specific medical terms um, that we are using. The word gravid means pregnant. So gravida refers to the number of pregnancy the woman has had, including this pregnant, present pregnancy, regardless of their outcome. Parity, or P, is, or para, refers to the number of pregnancy, not fetuses, carried past the age of viability, and the age of viability is considered 20 or more weeks. Each pregnancy is counted as one, even if the woman delivers twins or triplets. So the current pregnancy is not counted in parity because it did not have a result yet. What you look into always when you're giving those numbers, gravida needs to be higher than parity. Non-viable fetuses that deliver before the end of 20 weeks gestations are termed spontaneous abortion. Abortion, either spontaneous or therapeutic, are not counted in the parity total. The term primipara will use it for those women that are delivering for the first time, while multipara denotes a woman who has delivered more than once. Okay, let's, let's practice a little bit. So Susie has had three previous miscarriages and is now pregnant. So what is her G number, gravida, and what is her para number? Okay, so let me give you the answer. Gravida, again, refers to the, to the number of times the woman has been pregnant, regardless of the outcome of those pregnancies. So if Susie has had three previous miscarriages, this number three, and is now pregnant again, that's a fourth pregnancy, it means that the G number, gravida number, is four. Parity, or para, refers to the number of pregnancy, not fetuses, carried past the age of viability 20 or more weeks. So for each pregnancy is counted as one, even if the woman delivers twins or triplets. This current pregnancy will not be counted in the number of parity. Again, it para needs to be lower than the number of gravida. So for Susie, para is zero because she had three previous miscarriages and no viable um, fetus that was delivered past 20 weeks uh, of age of pregnancy. Now we are moving forward. And 
when we are recording the obstetric history, we are using uh, the term GPPAL, and we are going through this in a second. So obviously, the total number of pregnancies and deliveries will not gonna tell us the the full story about that person. Um, so we are using this acronym where G stands for gravida or the total number of pregnancy, including this one, this current one. T means the term deliveries. And this is the number of pregnancies that ended at term at or beyond 38 weeks of gestation. Um, we consider a pregnancy at term when it goes over week 38. Um, we have the P letter that stands for the preterm deliveries. And this is the number of pregnancy that ended after 20 weeks and before the end of 37 uh, weeks of gestation. We use the letter A or abortions for the number of pregnancies that um, ended before 20 weeks of gestation. And we have the letter L or living children, the number of children delivered who are alive at the time of history collection. It is important to obtain information regarding complications that may have occurred with other pregnancies. A problem the woman had in a previous pregnancy may present itself again in the current pregnancy or may increase the chance that she will develop another type of complication. For example, if a woman had um, a bleeding after a previous delivery, uh, she hemorrhaged before, she has a higher risk of hemorrhaging after the subsequent deliveries. She may have a clotting issue or she may be prone to develop one. This is also true for a previous history of gestational diabetes and preterm uh, deliveries. Any findings um, that presented in a previous pregnancy is an important part of the obstetric history. Now let's look at this, um, um, at this example here. So we have Victoria that comes into the office for prenatal care and when taking her history, she reports that her first pregnancy was a baby girl born at 29 weeks. She had a miscarriage at 17 weeks and her third child was a term girl born at 40 weeks. All of her children are living. And the question is, how will you um, document uh, her history in the GDPIL uh, format? I'm gonna give you a couple of uh, minutes and I will um, tell you the answer. So we are looking for the G or the Gravida number. And let's see how many times uh, Victoria was pregnant. So she had a baby girl, that's one, a miscarriage, two, and the third child um, that was born at term three, and it's pregnant again. So her G number is four. Now let's look at the term. How many of those pregnancies ended at term? or at or over 30, uh, 38 weeks of gestation. So one was born at 29 weeks, we cannot count that. Uh, we have a miscarriage, we cannot count that, but her third child was born at 40 weeks, so her T is one. How many preterms she had? So we define preterm, all those pregnancies that ended after 20 weeks, but before 37. Uh, so for her, none of those situation happens, so her P is a zero. Let's see at, uh, look at A. A for her is one because she had the miscarriage at 17 weeks. And let's look at L. The L says how many living children she has. And she actually has two living children, one born at 29 and one born at 40. During the first prenatal visit, there will be a full physical examination. Uh, the provider, either the physician or the nurse practitioner, will perform a complete head-to-toe physical 
Uh, in addition to that, a GYN examination will be performed. A vaginal examination, including a speculum examination, uh, as well as a bimanual examination of the uterus. Um, lab work will be also performed, including a complete a complete blood count, a uh, blood count with um, um, looking for any signs of anemia or any signs of thrombocytopenia uh, or elements of uh, conditions that need to be addressed at this stage. Uh, the blood type uh, will include um, the uh, type and screen uh, for um, the RH component. Um, in addition, um, levels of titers of um, immunoglobulins of antibodies for hepatitis B, um, rubella uh, will be drawn and in the lab work, we'll try to investigate to see if the patient uh, is not uh, having any type of um, infectious conditions as HIV, syphilis, gonorrhea, or chlamydia. Um, in addition to that, a urine culture will be performed. How do we establish the due date? And correct dating of the pregnancy is critical uh, to prevent unnecessary inductions uh, and to allow for the accurate treatment of any preterm labor. So it's, it's critical to understand that to not categorize the woman as overdue uh, or preterm based on an incorrect date. So there are several ways to, to date the pregnancy. The most common way to calculate the EDD is to use a uh, nasal rule. To determine the due date using the nasal rule, um, you add seven days to the date of the first day of the last menstrual period, LMP. Then you subtract three months. This is a simple way to estimate the due date, but it's highly dependent upon the woman knowing when the first date of their last menstrual period was, and is also based upon the fact that we presume that the woman will have the perfect 10-day menstrual cycle. So sometimes the EDD is impossible to determine based upon natural rule, particularly if the woman experiences irregular menstrual cycle or if she cannot remember the date, or she may have the wrong date in her mind. So in this case, during the pelvic examination, the healthcare provider will fill the size of the uterus and get an idea by the size of it um, of how far along the pregnancy is. And I'm going to give you an example. For instance, a uterus that is the size of a small pear is approximately seven weeks. If the uterus feels to be the size of an orange, the pregnancy is about 10 weeks old. And if um, the uh, uterus is felt the size of a grapefruit, that will be a 12-week uh, uterus. Let's look into other ways that we can validate the gestational age. Um, and this is by noting landmarks during the pregnancy. When we initially are able to detect the fetal heartbeat by Doppler, that will be somewhere between 10 and 12 weeks. Quickening typically occurs around 16 weeks for multigravidas and 20 weeks for premigravidas. Quickening is um, the baby movement that the patient is able to feel and report. And quickening is usually the sen uh, a fluttering sensation um, that the woman will feel um, is totally unpainful. And it happens a little bit earlier in the pregnancy only because the woman is aware of that and knows how to recognize it. That's why they are, they are reported around 16 weeks by women that had more than one pregnancy. And it's not recognized before 20 weeks when that flattering is, is quite strong enough um, to um, kind of allow the woman to recognize it. In addition to that, about 20 weeks of pregnancy, the uterus reaches the level of the umbilicus. One of the most common and most reliable way to, to date a pregnancy and to calculate the uh, EDD is through the what is called an obstetric sonogram or ultrasound. Um, high frequency sound waves are used uh, 
when we are using the ultrasound and they will reflect off the fetal and maternal pelvic structures and they will allow the sonographer to visualize the structures in real time. While doing that, the um, sonographer will measure fetal structures such as head and the femur, uh, and usually they will measure also the abdomen. And all those measurements allow the machine um, to put those numbers in a formula and estimate the gestational age for the fetus. And based on that, we can calculate the due date. The sooner we are able to have a sonogram in the pregnancy, the, most, the more accurate the due date will be. If there is a discrepancy between the EDD calculated using natal rule and the one determined by the sonogram, guess which one we will use? Well, you're right. We will use the results of the sonogram if it's done in the first half of the pregnancy um, and all our um, treatment, treatment decisions uh, will be based on uh, that result. So question one. Tell whether the following question is a true or false statement. When doing a GPPAL, you know that P stands for how many pregnancies a woman has had that ended at term or beyond 30 weeks of gestation. The answer is true because P stands for term and term is the number of pregnancies that ended at or beyond 30 weeks of gestation. How do we do the risk assessment in our patient? So the risk assessment will take into account all the information that we gathered through the history and physical examinations and the lab test. And you will see that many factors may put the pregnancy at risk. Um, so these factors um, may also include um, let's say a negative attitude of the woman toward the pregnancy as many times happens in an unwanted pregnancy. Another factor that may influence negative a pregnancy may be seeking prenatal care late in the pregnancy. Uh, whenever we identify maternal substance abuse as alcohol or tobacco or illicit drugs. Any type of history of complications with previous pregnancies or the presence of maternal disease also put current pregnancy at risk. We need to add to that social factors that may increase the risk of poor outcome is inadequate living conditions or domestic violence. If the woman is unaware of the adverse effects of tobacco and alcohol, um, if she's not aware of the benefits of folic acid or the risk of HIV, or the pregnancy is at an increased risk for complication, all those elements uh, may result in a poor outcome uh, for this pregnancy. Now, we need to add into that the age, and the age plays uh, sometimes an important factor. We will have nowadays more and more um, female patients that choose to become mother as an advanced age. Um, however, an advanced age may pose, might, might place the uh, patient uh, in a risk category. And in the risk category uh, for complicated pregnancy, we put in not only women older than 35 years of age, but also young teens. Let's look now and see what happens during the subsequent prenatal visit. So during those subsequent visits, weight, blood pressure, urine protein and glucose, um, and fetal heart rate uh, will be assessed and that data will be routinely collected and registered in the patient files. Um, also, um, the fundal height of the uterus will be measured at each visit. Uh, somewhere between week 18 and 32, uh, the fundal height in centimeters should match the gestational age of the pregnancy. For example, so you can understand the concept. If the woman is 18 weeks pregnant, the fundal height should measure 18 centimeters. Um, and the way that we are measuring that is with a woman laying um, supine and relaxed. Uh, and sometimes we may need to ask the patients to uh, bend their, to flex their knees a little bit to release the, the pressure on the abdominal wall muscles. 
um, and the examiner will slowly start to palpate and determine starting at the level of the cyphoid process uh, will examine the abdominal wall of the woman going down until they feel where the fundal the fundus of the uterus is now using um, a centimeter um, uh, strip will measure in between the uh, symphysis pubis and that place on the abdominal wall like a perpendicular line like straight line in between connecting those two points um, and that's the uh, how we measure the fundal height if there is any discrepancy between the size and the date the healthcare will usually uh, have to determine and tries to determine what is the cause of discrepancy usually uh, doing that with a sonogram for those fundal heights that are larger than expected um, that may indicate a few things first of all it may indicate that the original date was miscalculated it may mean also that the woman is carrying twins and obviously when you have more than one fetus the uterus will develop sooner and quicker and bigger we may have another situation that is called polyhydramnia or excessive amniotic fluid that is usually more than two liters or in some extreme cases there is a molar pregnancy and that's a pregnancy that doesn't develop having a fetus um, it's um, similar to a precancerous type of uh, pregnancy a fundal height that is smaller than expected could indicate again that original dates were miscalculated so a smaller one may indicate also an oligohydramnios or a too little than expected amniotic fluid usually less than 500 milliliters or that the fetus is smaller than expected and that is called an intrauterine uh, uh, growth failure after 32 weeks the fundal height does not correlate anymore with the gestational age in numbers uh, because of variances in uh, fetal growth and also it's related to the fact that um, it's dependent on the mother's body that you may have those very petite uh, patients that uh, the distances will not want to correlate on their torso at every visit um, we need to, in to um, inquire to ask our patients about any dangerous signals of pregnancy we'll need to ask about fetal movement if they do feel the uh, fetus moving every day about contractions and especially if those contractions are painful about any signs of bleeding and any type of fluid leak that may um, be a signal for a membrane rupture signs of preterm labor will include contractions and per definition we are looking for those that are more than four on an hour they have as they are placed lower on the um, on the back they are felt on the lower back of the woman they resemble a dull backache um, any type of pelvic pressure um, we ask them and describe them if the pain the contraction uh, looks like a menstrual like type of cramp uh, may be an increase in vaginal discharge and this is a sign of preterm labor or um, if they have a feeling that something is not right and always listen to your patients they live with their bodies if they say that something is not right they know what they are talking about now at this stage we do not perform another physical uh, another pelvic examination until late in the pregnancy that is very close to the expected time of delivery just to check if we are close to the delivery time let's look into the recommended screening and they um, occur at very particular times during the pregnancy um, if we are looking into those you see that at the end of the pregnancy we have the group b streptococcus that is associated with significant neonatal morbidity and mortality that means they are associated with high rates of diseases in newborns or even death of the newborn and especially um, if we are talking about the premature uh, infant so routine screenings and treatment with antibiotics in those positive patients uh, can reduce uh, the neonatal mortality um, and that's why we do routinely those um, 
tests in every woman that is 35 to 37 weeks of pregnancy and treat them with antibiotics if we found them uh, positive for uh, group B streptococcus. And that's a vaginal swab, just to make sure that we are talking about the same thing. Um, now, alpha fetoprotein, that's an interesting test. Uh, and it's a protein that will be produced by the fetus. The woman's blood will contain small amounts of this protein throughout the pregnancy. And the maternal serum alpha fetoprotein will start to be measured somewhere between the week 15 and 20, um, with an optimal time to uh, measure that between uh, 16 and 18 weeks of gestation. Any type of abnormal levels that can be either high or low may indicate a problem and the need for additional testing. Um, there are some situations where the uh, maternal serum alpha fetoprotein uh, are elevated, and um, those higher than expected levels will be seen in um, those patients that are carrying more than one fetus. And it's obvious because being two fetuses, both of them are producing it. When the fetus has um, died, or is called fetal demise, or in the presence of what is called a neural tube defect. So low, so higher levels of alpha fetal protein increase the suspicion and will ask for more uh, investigations because we believe that the nervous system of that fetus can be compromised. So nowadays, because of that, the main reason that we are measuring alpha fetal protein um, is to check for those neural tube defects and um, in those will include what is called uh, anencephaly or failure of the brain to develop normally. Uh, the fetus will have a full face, however, will not want to have uh, a cranium, will not want to have or have a, a barely developed uh, brain um, and skull. Or to diagnose spina bifida, which is the failure of the spine, of the spine um, arches, uh, the vertebras, to close completely during their development that allows the spinal cord to be exposed either under the skin and not covered by the bone that protects it, or even being completely uh, open to the outside environment, not even covered by the skin. So um, alpha fetal proteins are usually elevated uh, in fetuses that have those uh, anomalies. Uh, there are a few other anomalies that are on the ventral side, on the abdominal side of the uh, fetuses that are called omphalocele and gastroschisis. And those are failure of closing of abdominal wall during the uh, fetal development. And they may also cause elevated levels. And if we are looking into this, um, you will see that um, lower levels of alpha fetal protein uh, may indicate or raise the suspicion of a Down syndrome for that fetus. Other tests that, that we may uh, perform are the, uh, the screening tests that we can do for gestational diabetes, usually between week 24 and 28. And we are, um, for those patients that we identified them, at risk for any type of RH um, uh, sensitivity, will start the correction with gamma globulins injections for those RH negative patients with RH positive fetuses at week 28. Now, the assessment of fetal well-being. Um, healthy fetus will move and, quit and kick regularly. Um, However, your pregnant patients may not perceive those movements until week 16 for uh, those that had more than one pregnancy and around week 20 uh, for the first, uh, for those in uh, during their first pregnancy. So the fetus, just like um, any other human being, will undergo regular rest and activity cycles. And However, those cycles are different in a fetus. They go around, um, go and last around 40 to 60 minutes. So we may instruct our patients to monitor the baby movements on a daily basis um, and instruct women to choose a time of the day um, in which she can relax and count the baby movements. 
Uh, now, keep in mind that each kick or position change of the baby um, may count as one movement. Um, in the United States, we use the ultrasound uh, as the gold standard to determine the gestational age, to um, evaluate the fetus, and to diagnose any complication of pregnancy. Um, and this investigation is uh, safe and effective and uh, very um, easy, can monitor for the fetal well-being. Um, and the procedure can be performed frequently. Um, the sound waves that the ultrasound is using are unharmful to the mother or to the baby. So if we are looking only into the sonography, usually we can see the baby around, we can start visualizing the embryo about um, six weeks of gestation. Um, sometimes for those early stages of pregnancy, we can we need to do a transvaginal uh, ultrasound and not a transabdominal one. Um, ultrasounds that are performed at a very early stage of pregnancy um, may be diagnostic for pregnancy. Um, and also through the ultrasound a little bit later in the fetal development, uh, we can examine and establish the uh, fetal cardiac activity, the body movements in real time, and we can even diagnose if the um, if the um, fetus may have uh, cardiac malformations um, that can be addressed um, at the time of the pregnancy or later. Again, um, we are looking into um, the screening test that we are uh, doing to uh, protect the mother and the fetus. Um, just to summarize, the alpha fetal protein, we do that between 16 and 18 weeks. Uh, we have that associated with a variety of um, issues. Um, mainly, we are performing that to for an early diagnosis of fetal spinal defect. And we have what is called the triple marker screening. We are using for diagnosing that uh, three tests. We are putting together the results of the alpha fetal protein with the HCG uh, levels also determined in the mother's blood and also with the unconjugated uh, estriols. An abnormal result doesn't mean that something is definitely wrong with the fetus. It's a screening test that places your patient to a higher risk for a condition. And that means that we may need to address that patient and evaluate and examine them in depth to make sure that everything is okay. Uh, so usually when we have those three um, tests with levels that are abnormal, we are screening also for chromosomal uh, abnormalities in those um, fetus. Another type of investigation that we can do is called an amniocentesis. And the amniocentesis is a diagnostic procedure. And in this procedure, a needle um, is inserted into the amniotic sac um, under the control um, and under vision uh, by using an ultrasound. And a small amount of the amniotic fluid is removed. This amniotic fluid will be examined in lab and we are looking for biochemical chromosomal uh, and we can do even genetic studies um, to diagnose if that pregnancy, that fetus, is at risk. We perform that procedure between 15 and 20 weeks of gestation. Um, although in some cases we can do an early amniocentesis at 12 to 14 weeks. Um, so amniocentesis can determine the genetic makeup, um, will establish uh, without any doubt the gender of the fetus, because in the amniotic fluid, we have fetal cells and we'll examine those. Now, you see that amniocentesis, we can do it between the week 15 and 20. However, we can do it a little bit earlier. What happens in those cases that we have patients that need to have genetic um, consults um, earlier in the pregnancy and they need to determine if they want to continue with that pregnancy? And if that fetus may be affected, some of your patients may decide not to continue the pregnancy. And it's harder to um, interrupt a pregnancy um, around 20 weeks of gestation. And it's 
easier uh, on the mother's body, um, both physical and emotional, if the pregnancy is ended up uh, sooner. So for those cases, we cannot wait for uh, the time that we will be able to perform an amnio. We need in those cases to be able to perform an examination quicker and sooner. And in those cases, what we can do is hold a chorionic uh, villus sampling. And it's very similar to the amnio because it allows me to uh, remove cells that uh, will be fetal cells. So I can look at the chromosome. So the indications for the uh, CVS are the same as the amnio. Um, again, the advantage is that we can do it early in the pregnancy. However, um, there are risks associated with that because the cervix will be open and um, that may expose as a side effect, as a complication of the procedure, uh, may expose the woman to um, um, an abortion, an, an, a miscarriage, I'm sorry. So based on the results of those examinations, um, the woman may decide on what is called an elective uh, abortion. So elective abortions that are done um, early in the gestational uh, time, between 8 and 12 weeks of gestations, are safer. So uh, for both of those um, examinations, because they are highly invasive, uh, we need to have an informed consent signed by the woman um, that uh, confirms that she understands all the uh, risks associated with this procedure. The assessment of the fetal well-being, if we continue with that, what we can do, another type of um, examination is what is called a percutaneous umbilical blood sampling. And uh, this is also known as a chordocentesis. It performs similar to the amniocentesis, the only difference is that uh, if the amniocentesis is aiming for the amniotic sac and amniotic fluid for the chordocentesis, the needle needs to be able to penetrate and uh, extract fetal blood from the umbilical cord. It's performed in a, in a manner that is totally similar to the amniocentesis and requires informed consent. And the, uh, the ultrasound will locate the placenta uh, through the ultrasound, we'll locate fetal structures because we don't want to injure those in the process. And while the needle is inserted, it will be the, uh, the place where uh, we are aiming for is the cord close to the insertion to the placenta. Um, so usually we do those type of uh, investigations that you can understand that they are kind of difficult to be performed and you need people that are highly trained in how to do that. Um, we are doing that in very special cases. Uh, we are trying to diagnose uh, blood conditions, usually congenital blood conditions as hemophilia. Um, as an example of that is the von Willebrand disease that will predispose the baby to um, unexpected and uh, critical bleeding uh, episodes. Uh, we are looking for thrombocytopenia or hemolytic disease. It can also diagnose uh, the fetal infection uh, with toxoplasmosis, rubella, uh, CMV, uh, varicella zoster, um, parvo, uh, or HIV. Now, if we are looking into um, a less invasive uh, examinations, we can do what is called a non-stress test. The NST is non-invasive and it's actually monitoring the fetal well-being. Somewhere after the week 28, the fetal nervous system is mature enough uh, to enable the fetal autonomic nervous system to periodically accelerate the heart rate. So in this test, we are aiming and we are analyzing and um, gaining data about the fetal heart rate. And uh, we are doing that by using the external fetal monitor. We place the external fetal monitor and we are tracing and evaluating for fetal heart rate accelerations every 20 minutes. Generally, we are expecting to see at least two acceleration of the fetal heart rates for at least an increase of 15 beats uh, that will be increased for at least 15 seconds. So again, if I see two accelerations of the fetal heart rate 
that lasts for at least 15 seconds and the fetal heart rate increases for with at least 15 beats above the baseline, the test is reactive. So in the presence of a reactive non-stress test, we assume that the fetal well-being is uh, good and uh, we are not expecting to uh, examine that patient for at least uh, one week. Now we know that the uterine contraction may cause momentary reduction of uroplacental blood flow, which may stress the fetus. What I'm trying to say is that when the uterine contracts, the pressure that is put on the blood vessels in the placenta is reducing the blood that is delivered to the fetus. As a result of that, the fetus nervous system will respond to that, responds to hypoxia, gets less oxygen. The contraction stress test, or the CSC, uh, monitors the fetus's response to contractions in order to determine the fetal well-being. And this is a test that we would like to perform uh, on a patient just to test the ability of that fetus to go through a normal vaginal delivery. We may have those pregnancies that were at high risk with fetuses that were not performing that well, were not doing so well um, during the pregnancy that we may be afraid to put them through the process of a vaginal delivery that can be very stressful and very aggressive on their little bodies. And we may decide that this will be one of those uh, patients that will um, look for an elective C-section. So let's look what the contraction stress test is doing. So we have the woman uh, on an external fetal monitoring, just as for the non-stress test. And there are three ways to um, determine the uterine to not to determine, there are three ways to uh, obtain uterine contractions uh, for a CST. One way is to wait for the woman to have those spontaneous Brexton Hicks contractions. Um, and then there is no need to induce contractions. And the Brexton Hicks are those training um, contractions that the uterus is normally performing at a certain point towards the end of the pregnancy will start to periodically contract. They are not painful. However, they will put the baby at stress. Another way to induce uterine contractions is by nipple stimulation. As a result of the nipple stimulation, there is a release of oxytocin from the posterior pituitary gland. And the oxytocin is stimulating the uterus to contract. The third way will be by putting the woman on an IV drip of pitocin, which is a synthetic oxytocin to induce contraction. And what we are aiming for, our goal will be to have three contractions of at least 40 seconds duration in a period of 10 minutes. And then we will monitor the, we'll have this monitor strip analyzed and we see how the baby reaction is to the stress of the contraction. If they are able to increase their fetal heart rate and to maintain an increased fetal heart rate to compensate for the hypoxia at the level of the brain, or they are increasing and losing that. That means that the baby will not gonna go do well while being um, in the process of a vaginal birth. So let's see question number two. If the result of a maternal serum alpha fetoprotein is lower than expected, it may indicate that the baby will be born with what? Neural tube defect, omphalocele, down syndrome or trisomy 17. And the response is down syndrome. If you remember the low levels of alpha fetoprotein will be associated with an increased risk for a down syndrome baby, while all the rest of them, all three of the other ones will be associated with high levels of alpha fetoprotein. So what are potential threats to mother or fetus symptoms? We are educating our patients to look for elevated blood pressure, a sudden weight gain, any type of epigastric pain, vaginal bleeding, decreased fetal movement, 
were any signs of preterm labor. And all those elements, we instruct the patient to call the doctor or visit the office immediately. Now you can see here that pregnancy is a wonderful time. It's a time that most women are um, enjoying. However, there is a long list of common discomforts that are associated with pregnancy. And they are uh, lined up here and you can see that they range from bleeding gums and nasal stuffiness, nosebleed, a breast tenderness, nausea with or without vomiting, feeling faint, ankle edema, we call that cankles, hemorrhoids, trouble sleeping, fatigue throughout the whole pregnancy, shortness of breath, heartburn, low back pain, round ligament pain, and that's a pain that shows at the level of the inguinal canal and it's very typical uh, for uh, patients, um, for those patients that are experiencing their first uh, pregnancy is um, it happens towards the end of the first trimester when the uh, uterus that is kept in place by the round ligament um, is expanding and growing outside the pelvis inside the abdominal cavity. It doesn't happen with the subsequent pregnancies. It's kind of a um, muscle memory that the body has and it happens only with the first one. Leg cramps and later varicose veins, uh, flatulence and obviously constipation. The constipation is a result of two elements put together. Um, it's the result of the increased hormones that are relaxant uh, from the progesterone type of uh, hormones that uh, follow the woman throughout her pregnancy uh, throughout those uh, nine months and also can be the result of using um, iron uh, supplements that will predispose uh, the patients to constipation.